and welcome back. This month is Women's History Month, so we'll be talking about a few amazing women who have definitely had an impact on the world over the next few weeks. Anyway, let's get started today with a video semi-related to the Tuskegee experiment. We'll be talking about Henrietta Lacks and her story because this woman is not talked about enough. Henrietta Lacks and her unwitting contributions have forever changed the medical and scientific fields with similar concerns of informed consent and of ethics that we discussed in that previous video. So, who was Henrietta Lacks and why is her story so important? Let's start at the beginning. Henrietta Lacks was born Loretta Pleasant on August 1st, 1920 in Roanoke, Virginia. Not long into her little life, Henrietta's mother died during childbirth with the birth of her 10th child. Her father, Johnny, then took himself and the now 10 kids to live in Clover, Virginia. The siblings were spread out among relatives because, as you can probably imagine, caring for 10 children was just too much for one man to bear, especially after the loss of his wife. Henrietta ended up with her maternal grandfather, Tommy Lax. While here, she lived in the former slave quarters on a plantation that was once owned by her great-grandfather and great-uncle. Oddly enough, she lived not only with her first cousin, but also with her future husband, David. When Henrietta was only 14 years old, she gave birth to her first child with David, aka Day. It was a baby boy named Lawrence. Four years later, she gave birth to their second child, Elsie. Elsie actually ended up having developmental disabilities that left her to be described as deaf and dumb by family. A couple short years after her birth, Henrietta and Day were married on April 10, 1941. The family then made the move to Turner Station in Baltimore County, Maryland at the advice of their cousin, Fred. Fred ended up leaving for World War II not long after, but left his cousins with enough savings that they were fortunate enough to buy a house at 713 New Pittsburgh Avenue. Turner Station was actually one of the oldest and largest African American communities in Baltimore County. Henrietta and Day ended up having three more children after this, Sonny, Deborah, and Joseph, with the last being in 1950. In a cruel twist of fate, the very same place that her last son was born would be the very same place that she would be diagnosed with cervical cancer only four and a half months later. This was Johns Hopkins Hospital. Johns Hopkins was the only hospital in the area that treated black patients. Keep in mind, this is prime time Jim Crow pre-civil rights era. She had a knot in her stomach, and not like a bad feeling, but like a physical knot, before giving birth to Joseph, and it still remained after his birth. This, alongside some pretty severe bleeding, is what finally got her into the hospital in January of 1951. It didn't take long until she was referred to the gynecology department in February. While here, the doctors found something that would change not only Henrietta's life, but the course of medicine as we know it. They did a biopsy and found that she had a cervical tumor and she was subsequently diagnosed with cervical cancer. It was during her treatment that they ended up taking two tissue samples from her cervix. This was done without her permission or her knowledge. Based on what I read in an excerpt from The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, her husband was asked, but he actually refused. It's similar to the way the men of Tuskegee were told that they were being treated. They were actually just test subjects. Henrietta was actually being treated but also had these samples taken without her consent. Taking samples and sending them onto the lab without telling the patients was actually a common practice at the time. In fact, the cell samples were sent to Dr. George Gay at a nearby tissue lab, and cells had been sent to him for years for examination. These human cell samples were never able to be kept viable for very long outside of the body. That was until Henrietta's cells came along. Not only did her cells survive, but they replicated and doubled every 20 to 24 hours. Unfortunately, her cells would live on longer than she would as she ended up dying not long after her diagnosis. After succumbing to her cancer on October 4th, 1951, an autopsy revealed that the cancer had metastasized throughout her entire body. Now let's talk a bit more about her cells. After being taken without her knowledge or permission, and having discovered their ability to multiply indefinitely, 
Dr. Gay went on to supply other scientists around the world with them. Although he didn't make any money from doing so, Henrietta Lacks was never acknowledged and her family wasn't informed. The Hella cells, Hella coming from the first two letters of both her first and last name, have been used for almost every kind of medical and drug research imaginable, from testing the live polio vaccine to studying Parkinson's and leukemia. It's even been used to study COVID-19. In fact, over 17,000 patents exist involving the Hella cells. While her cells are still used today in research, the family finally has a say over who gets access to the genome. The family didn't find out about the cells until 1973, and the story later became front page news in 2010. Things got worse in 2013 when the European Molecular Biology Laboratory published the Hella genome without the family's consent. Not only was this a further abuse of Henrietta's cells, but had the potential to reveal genetic information regarding her living descendants. It was a real snowball effect from when those cells were first taken. This utter violation of privacy led to the creation of the Hella Genome Data Use Agreement, with two members of the Lacks family sitting on the board that grants permission to access the genome information. From the moment her cells were taken, up until her family finally had a say in who had access to the genetic information, there were countless ethical violations with regards to informed consent and privacy. Other countries have since followed suit with similar rules and laws in place to protect patients and their privacy, as well as regarding informed consent, as we spoke about in the video on the Tuskegee experiment. There is no doubt that her cells brought a wealth of knowledge and changed medicine and science as we know it. But at what cost? Would it have been so difficult to ask for permission beforehand? What about asking for permission from her family after her passing? I can't say for certain, but I can imagine that a good portion of the population, if put in the same situation, would have gladly given permission. If someone told me that donating a tissue sample could save countless lives and asked if I'd be willing, I'd of course say yes. I am an organ donor. But the important part is being given the opportunity to make that decision, and Henrietta or her family were never given the option until years after her death and the continuous use of her cells. Anyway, that is all I have for today. Thank you for joining me to learn about Henrietta Lacks. We owe her a great debt for the contribution she made, although she should have been given the option to knowingly make that contribution. I'll see you guys next time. No.